and that tells you how much it slides. Okay, and then you can fully know the position of everything in that mechanism at any theta 2 input. And that's position analysis is finding and solving those equations. Um, and then you can know the whole, equa the whole mechanism. Okay. All right, so now we're going to talk about rules for choosing vectors in the loop. All right, so... Okay, so these are a little uh, tricky. Um, you're probably wondering now, how in the world can I draw vector loops that will work? Because there's plenty of attempts that will not work and they'll waste a lot of your time. And then there's even attempts that will work and are true and you could solve, but they might tell you things you didn't even want to know or care about. So you have to be very clever about how you draw your vector loops. And it's, it's a real art that takes a lot of experience, so you should practice with a lot of mechanisms. But there are some rules of thumb and tricks, okay? So I'm going to read this here real quick. If all the joints of a mechanism are pin joints, the choices is, is, are fairly obvious, right? You just connect the pins, right? Pin joints are the most obvious. You're always going to point to a pin or from a pin, okay? But for other situations, some suggestions may be in order. Remember that the vector should be chosen and defined such that the variables, you know, the lengths and the angles are, are variables of interest in the mechanism. Okay, so make sure you're, you actually care about the unknowns that you want to solve. Okay, you got to think, what would I care to solve? Okay, blow are some hints. Okay, so let's look at some, the first hint. They say, you know, you've got this link here, um, link 6, and it's attached to some link 7. And in link 7, there's a big slot cut out of link 7. And then you've got another link 8 sliding in this slot. Okay? So how, how would you draw vectors dealing with that? Well, um, first of all, you have to think, um, well, you know, I care about the translation of 8 in this, in this sliding joint, right? And so we're probably going to want to make an arrow that, that points in the direction that 8 is sliding. Okay? So, that, that's, so you're, if you ever have a slot, have an arrow going in that direction, okay? And... Um, and then, you know, you're always pointing from a pin to some point. Now, we didn't have to point there. We could have pointed to the end there and then had the arrow go there. And that would work. It just makes your life more complicated, okay? You should always, where you can point to points um, and arrows, you should try and make them be 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians, right? Because that's just going to simplify your life and make cosine and sine either 0 or 1 or negative 1 or, you know, something simple, right? And so... So, you know, for this situation, I'd recommend, you know, to define 6, probably from some pin down here to there, that would be 6. But pointing from that pin to that point, this point is a point on 7. It doesn't look like it. You know, in your mind, you'd probably want to point from there to there, because that is visibly a point on 7. And from that point on 7 to that point on 7, that would capture the rotation and the position of 7. You could rightfully call it 7. But then you couldn't make the angle 90 degrees. Even though this point that it's pointing to isn't technically on the body because it's on the slot that's cut out, um, you can point there and pretend it's on the body uh, so that it moves with it. And, and here's a really important point that takes students um, some time to, to grapple with. Any point in space, whether it's physically on the body or outside the body, can be considered part of the body if it moves with the body. Right? So say I just took some random point over here. I could pretend that point is either on 6 if I wanted to. Say I had a fixed point on 6 here and a fixed point on 6 here. You could just imagine if I drew a boundary out here that encompassed it. Now you could, you could easier in your mind envision these two points moving with respect to each other as part of 6. But I could also assume the same point is on 7. If I just get rid of that appendage in my mind and now I draw an appendage from 7 encompassing it, then you, you could easily visualize that that point on 7 and that point would move with 7 and that would work. So just because, I mean, the, the body shape is somewhat arbitrary. and Whether the slot is cut here or whether the slot begins here and that point is in the body, it's totally arbitrary. It doesn't matter. You just want to think, you want to make sure you know what point you're envisioning moving with the body, okay? So in this point, even though this point is technically not on 7, we're going to pretend it's on 7 and it moves with 7 and then that will truly capture the position of 7. Okay, so just to recap, if you've got a slot, you're going to have a vector that points in the direction of the slot, the thing you care about, and then you want to 
point from pin joints and you want to make a 90 degree angle is going to make your life a lot easier. And realize that this point is on 7 and moving with it. Okay? But remember, like I said, you know, for any mechanism, any linkage, you could put a point anywhere and, and envision it moves with that linkage. Okay, so I'll show you some more examples. Okay, this is a similar case now, but instead of like a, a prism joint like slot, we have a pin in a slot, and now this is seven, this is six, and this is say five. Okay, um, you do care about how the pin slides, so you're always going to want to put a vector, uh, you know, going in the direction of the slot, pointing to the center of the pin. The difference is, is we're not going to call this the number, you know, th this pin is attached to seven. We're not going to call this R7 because it doesn't capture the rotation of 7. You'd have to think of two points on 7 with an arrow, and then you'd label that R7, and that would capture the rotation of 7. This just captures the distance between that point, which you're going to pretend is on 6, and, and this point, which is on 7. So this doesn't capture the position of really any link, so you're just going to call it something, whatever you want, as long as it's not 5, 6, or 7 here, according to this labeling. You could call it R, RD or wh whatever you want. Um, in this case, we just called it R8 because there's not an eighth link shown. Okay? But it's a necessary vector. Like I said, sometimes and many times, vector loops have vectors that uh, aren't associated with a link and don't capture the position or magnitude of any link. They're just necessary to make the equation work. Okay? And that's in this case. But it's the same as last time. You have a vector in this direction. You have a vector going from here to here. It's 90 degrees, and you pretend this point's on 6. So this guy truly moves with 6 and captures its motion, so you call R6. Another vector would be there to there or something. Capture R7. Another vector from here to here would capture 5. So you'd have 5, 6, and 7 taken. But you need this special eighth vector to capture the translation of that slot. OK, so now say you have some arbitrary shaped link. In this case, it's called link 3. And there's a circular slot cut in it. And now there's a pin or some prison, you know, whatever, sliding in that circular slot. Okay? If ever that's the case, you'd want to know what the center of that circle is. And they'll always give it to you in the form of you know, some cross or something. And when you see that cross, you have to ask yourself, well, what's, what's that the center of? Is it the center of this bottom curve circle? No. Is it the center of the top curve circle? No. It's the one in the middle. The one in the middle is the one that the pin follows. So if they give you a cross here, you have to realize that's the center of the circular slit's central axis. Okay? All right, so that's you know, anytime you see the cross there near a circular slit, it's got to be a circular slit. This doesn't work for any other kind of slit. It's got to be a, a pure you know, circle, and that's going to be the center of the, the, the center line there. Okay? You know, the central circle that goes through there, that's the center of it. All right. Okay, so anytime you have that scenario, first of all, you know, you're going to point from the pin of 2. You know, there's link 2, there's a pin 3. You're going to point to this pin, and you're going to go to the center of that. You're, you're, generally, if there's a cross, you want to point to it. That's, that's a good rule of thumb, although there may be some red herrings, so be careful. But uh, if it's the center of a circular slot, you're definitely going to want to point to it. And that will be, you see, that's a point on 3, that's a point on 3. Because obviously, as you move 3, the slot moves with 3. And therefore, the center of the slot circle is going to move with 3. So I hope you can see that as I move 3, this cross will move and the slit will move with it. OK, so this, this is always a point on 3. That's a point on 3. And so if you draw that vector, which you definitely should, you need to label this R3 to be correct and get a point on an exam because it captures, it tells me you know that it captures the rotation and the movement of 3. OK, so, but now you'd also point from the center here to the pin or the, or the rectangle, whatever that slides in the slot. You'd need that um, because you're going to always know the magnitude of that. They're going to give you, that's the, the radius of this circle, this uh, central circle. Uh, it ra you know, its center is there, so from there to the edge of that circle, that's going to be the radius. And when you're checking, your, you know, doing your bookkeeping stuff, you're, you're always going to know the magnitude of this vector. You're always going to put a check there, and that's going to be very valuable. It's the theta of that you won't know. That'll be a question mark. But uh, you still want that vector in there. Um, 
And again, you're going to name it something other than this link, that link, and that link, because it doesn't capture the rotation of any of the links. Uh, in this case, we have link 2, 3, and 4, so we're just going to call R5, because there's no other 5 link. You could call R7, R8, R10, anything you want, RL, whatever, right? And you'd be correct. But you need that vector. You need to name it something other than the links. And you are, when you do the vector loop, you're going to know its magnitude. OK, so just uh, two more, but these are the trickiest. OK, so if you have, um, if you have, if you ever have the case where you have two circles in external contact, so two external circles and they're touching at a point here, then, and they give you this cross T, that means it's the center of this circle. So if you imagine a circle there, this is, would be the center of it. And then here's a circle. It's easy to imagine that because I draw it. But there is the center of that. What you're always going to do is draw a vector that points from that center of the circle to that center of the circle. And the reason is because the question is, are you going to know the magnitude of this thing? Yes, you do, because you, you can measure. You know the magnitude of the radius of this circle. It's the distance from that point to any point out here including that point, that's the radius. And then you know the radius of this one. They're going to give you the radius of this circle. So you know that. So you'll always know the magnitude of this because it's the radius of that plus the radius of that. OK? Now, it's not going to, you're not going to name it any of the lengths again. It doesn't capture the motion or position of any of the lengths. It's just a vector you need to solve the vector loop equation. And you're always going to know its magnitude. It's the radius of this plus the radius of that, OK? But so in, in the book, they usually, if this is length 2 and this is length 3, they do R2, 3. Or you could do R3, 2. Or you could really do anything you want. They just, they just use that convention because there's two external circles touching, so they use both numbers. But I wouldn't dock you on an exam if you call this RD or RL or R28 or wh whatever you want. Okay? As long as you, you call it something other than 2, 3, and 4 according to this numbering. You just don't want to give it a number that is, is associated with an, a link that actually exists. OK? OK, and then of course, you know, if this is R2, that's a pin on who knows what. You're going to point from pin to there. Those are two points on R2. Of course, as link 2 moves, this circle is going to move with it, obviously, because it's part of link 2. And the center of the circle is obviously going to move with it. So this, I hope you see that R2 represents the position of 2 and how that moves. And then this guy here, that, that's a point on 3, and that's a point on 3. So same thing. You'd want to call this R3, because this fixed point on 3 that moves with it, and that fixed point on 3 that moves with it, is going to capture the angular position of R3. Okay? And if you want to do R4, it would be something from there to the edge there, whatever, and that would capture R4. But this is R23. So basically, if you have, the bottom line is if you have two circles. Remember, it doesn't work with ellipses. It doesn't work with, you know, it's got to be two circles externally in contact, always do a vector that connects the center of those circles, and uh, label it something that's different than any of the links, and you will know its magnitude is the radii of both circles added together. OK? OK, this is the hardest one to visualize. This is internal contact, OK? So imagine you have a link that has a circular surface. It's got to be a circle. And they will give you this cross here. That means it's the center of that circle. And they'll give you this radius, OK? And then you have another link, OK, where it's, this circle is touching the inside of this circle, OK? Now, this is a little deceptive because you might think, well, this is a circle too, but that doesn't matter. This circle doesn't affect anything. Okay, like th you, this, this, this could be shaped like Mickey Mouse for all you care about. What's important is this circle, and this is the center of that circle. So you always care about the two circles that are touching. You know, in this case, here's a circle, and there's a circle they're touching. You want the centers of those two. In this case, this is the circle you care about, and this circle. And there's the center of that circle, and there's the center of that circle. We don't care about the shape of this at all. Like, I could make this some giant, weird thing. This is the circle. That's its center, OK? And it's really important that you recognize, uh, visualize in your head, if, this, if link 3 moves, is this point going to move with it? Absolutely, because that's the center of this circle. I can't move that link without moving that edge with it. And that edge you know, has a center of a circle, and that center of the circle is going to move with it. If you can't visualize that, 
then, then just visualize like an appendage coming off of length three that circumscribes that point uh, or en encompasses it. And then as three moves, you can visualize that moving up with it. But you want to definitely visualize the center of this touching circle, not this one, not any, this touching circle, the center of it is, is a point stuck on three that's moving with it, okay? So therefore, when, notice this, we're going to point from the center of this guy's circle to the pin on the body. This point and this point are both two points on three and they move with three. You have to visualize that, you have to realize that point is on three and that point is on three because it's the center of this circle cut out, okay? And therefore, if I point from there to there, I better call it R3 because it's going to capture the rotation of three. Okay, and you know, for two, it's easy. You point from the pin on two to this point. This, this point's much more obviously on two. It's inside of it. It's easy to visualize as this circle moves. You know, this is rolling and sliding contact. It can rub and slide, um, you know. Uh, this guy moves with two, so those two points on two, it's much easier to visualize that's R2. Okay, but now, just like you connected these two and called it R2-3, you're going to connect the center of this circle with the center of this circle, which is right there, and give it a vector. And again, the book calls it R2-3, if it's that, or R3-2, but you can call it whatever you want, okay? As long as it's not two or three in this example. It's just anything that's not a link, okay? And why is this so powerful? You're always going to do this. If, if it's an internal circle touching a bigger external circle, you want to know the center of those two circles and you want to connect them. Why? Because you will always know the magnitude of the length of this. And what is that magnitude? It's a little harder to see, but if I were to draw this whole circle and you were to see that that's the center, and then I were to draw this whole circle and you see that's the center, you would see the distance between the two centers is the radius of this circle minus the radius of that circle. So I would recommend on your piece of paper at home, draw a whole circle, okay, and then draw that radius, which goes from there to there, and then draw this whole circle, and draw this radius, which goes there to there. So you take the radius of the outer circle minus that radius, and you get that. And no matter how these move, no matter how much it slides or rolls, imagine R2 moving up or down, and 3 is touching, and again, you're not allowed to break the joint, you can't lift this off. These guys always have to be touching at the joint. As they move, this will always be the radius of this circle minus the radius of that circle. So you can think of that distance minus that distance is that distance. It will never change, so you can always put a check bar above it. Okay? So you really want to internalize and think about this one. This one's really tricky, um, but very, very important. Okay, so a couple other little tricks here. Um, uh, Okay, so we've already kind of talked about this, but once, you know, just make sure you choose your coordinate system wisely when you're doing vector loops. Uh, you always pretty much want to fix it to a pin. Uh, that's usually the, the wisest thing to do, and, and sometimes it's nice to fix it to the ground pin um, so it doesn't move, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and you want to orient the X and Y axes so that, uh, you know, they're... Uh, you know, nice orthogonal angles are sharing the same line as this vector. Because you can imagine, if you draw the components as vector and the x, y axes were moved up there, its components would be weird to find. Whereas in this case, the y component is zero and the x component is just its length times i, you know, the i unit vector. So um, you want to be nice and easy to yourself and pick it. But you can pick it almost anywhere you want. And as long as you get the right answer, you get the right answer, you know. Uh, if you make your life really hard mathematically, that's fine. If you like a challenge, that's cool. Don't recommend it, on, especially on an exam when you're timed or something. Um, but, uh, you know, make your life easy. But if you get the right answer, you get the right answer, okay? And, and you, you also need to realize there's multiple vector loops that could be correct. There's different points you could attach to, and as long as you have two equations and two unknowns, you can solve it, and it's the two unknowns you wanted to solve, uh, there's many vector loops that could work. So there's not just one right answer. But, and there are many wrong answers. There's, there's obviously many attempts that don't work that are unsolvable. And then there's many attempts that could work that, that uh, could be right. And some are easier to do than others. So hopefully on an exam with these uh, tricks that I've taught you, you can, um, you know, you can, you can uh, guess your way to a, a nice clean vector loop that will work 
and uh, will be clean and, and easy mathematically to solve. Um, and you get experience with this. It, you get much, much, it gets much easier. And uh, oftentimes there is only one answer. And, uh, and it's, it's, uh, you know, it becomes obvious with practice. Okay, so another concept or complex vector loop. So in all the examples we've done so far, there's just been one vector loop. One vector loop equation that, you know, vectors all loop back and they all draw on each other and, and you can solve it, you know, um, and that's, that's, just a, that's just your simple vector loop. But anytime there are mechanisms and the one for your project, um, actually, um, you'll see, uh, will require multiple vector loops to solve. So, you know, there, there could be multiple things going on in a mechanism with multiple uh, closed kinematic chains and you, you'll need to solve for multiple vector loop equations to find all the unknowns and those are called complex vector loops. So we'll, we'll do an example a little bit later about that, okay? Okay, are the chosen vector loops good enough? That's the question you should always ask and there's really two criteria. The first we've really hit home which is make sure if it's a two-dimensional planar thing with two equations in the vector loop equation that you have two unknowns, two question marks or don't proceed. You're not going to be able to solve it. So do that bookkeeping trick early on. Uh, and then the second thing is, do the variables included, are they the ones we want to know? I mean, it would be a real bummer if you got to the end and, uh, you know, you solve for two unknowns, but neither of the two unknowns was something you cared about. You know, like, um, you know, I, I don't know, this isn't a, a great example, but, uh, you know, like, um, we did an example earlier where, you know, you clearly want to know the rotation of one of the links, but you don't need to know how the length of that link uh, changes from its pinpoint to where the circle touched it. And it's like, okay, you might find that length change, but like you don't care about it. Now other things you, you don't care about, but you need to solve to solve the ones you care about. My point is just make sure uh, at least one of the two question marks is a variable you actually care to solve as a function of the input value, okay? So, so that's, those are some notes about that. So, with those, um, we're going to do just a bunch of examples here. Um, and uh, hopefully that will uh, um, really solidify this in your mind. As we go through these examples, I really want you to, um, uh, you know, put me on pause on this video and try and do it yourself because uh, you could see hundreds of examples, and if I just give you the answer, it'll make sense to you. You'll be like, yeah, 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 I get it. It makes sense. That's a good vector loop, and I can see how to solve it. But you'd be surprised when you sit down on an exam and you actually have to do this yourself without experience. You, you, you'll just, you really won't know what to do. So there's some things in your brain that only your brain can figure out by trying to think of this on your own without seeing the answer. So, um, you know, here's the first example but I really want you to put me on pause and try and solve it yourself. Draw a vector loop, draw what you think we'd care about. You know, in this case, uh, we're gonna, you know, be moving, two is the input, one is the ground, and we're gonna be, probably have a linear motor moving two back and forth, so that's the input. And, you know, we probably don't care about how theta three changes, but we're gonna care about how four moves. Right, so, so that's what we care about. You think about that first, what do we care about? And then try and draw a closed vector loop and do the vector loop equation and see if it works. So go ahead and put me on pause and then uh, we'll pick up and I'll give you the solution. Okay, I'm gonna assume you did that. So I'm gonna give you the solution. Um, okay, the, the most obvious one is pointing to the, between the two pins, okay? And uh, so that, and that obviously is R3, you label that, because that captures the rotation of three, okay? And then um, the other one you, that's obvious, or hopefully it's a little less obvious, but uh, you, know, you need to track the position of two, and so that's gonna tell you as this changes, that's the input you're given, that's two. And then you wanna track the, uh, the displacement of four as well, it's, it's position. So, and that the magnitude of that will tell you where four is, and it's a nice closed loop. So this is the simplest way to do it. You might have come up with something different, and maybe what you came up with is correct, as long as it works, right? Um, but uh, this is the way I did it, and um, you know we could have. Uh, well, this is much. You know, you want these to be 90 degrees, and you want them to be, uh, you know, pointing 
you know, parallel to the ground they're sliding on because that's, you know, nice and clean. Um, but let's, let's see if my thing works, okay? So again, we drew the arrows any way we wanted. You might have done the same thing but done the arrows differently, and that's fine. It'll, it will work, I promise. If you don't believe me, do it for both of ours. Plug in the component form and stick to the convention. You'll see it'll all work and be true, okay? So um, it looks like we're starting here. Let's see. Or no, it looks like we're starting here and walking this way. So we just randomly start here, and we're going to walk clockwise. So we do plus, negative, plus. Plus, negative, plus, okay, as long as you stick to that, it should be true. Uh, if you go and ask yourself, do we know the magnitude of R3, the length? Yes, we could measure that. It doesn't change as two slides. We know that one, okay? Do we know the angle? No, we don't. The angle, you know, in this case, the tail is here, so you do the horizontal line here, and you go all the way around, it would be theta 3. As two slides, that angle is going to change. So we don't know that. That's a question mark. Okay, R2, do we know the magnitude of R2? Sure, that's the input. That, if we had a linear motor that would push this in a straight line, the length that this changes, that's the input on the magnitude. That's where you'd put the I, okay? And then the angle, do we know the angle? Well, sure, we do know it. It's always, it's zero, because the tail is here. You draw a horizontal line, horizontal length of that is zero. So you'd know that, and it's zero, okay? Do we know the magnitude of R4? Uh, the, the magnitude of this guy, as, as, theta, as, as R2 slides, this is going to change. So no, we don't know that. And that's obviously, so that's the question mark, that's obviously the one we care about. Uh, as this changes, we want to know what R4 is. So that's, so, you know, in, in your mind, you're like, okay, great, we're at least capturing what we care about. Um, and that's one of our question marks. Okay, and then do we know the angle? Sure we do. And, and what is it? Well, here's the tail of it. You draw a horizontal line there and go there. That's pi over 2. And make sure you use radians or you'll be in big trouble. So check mark, we know that, and it's pi over 2. All right? Okay, so we have an equation, and we have two, you know, two equations in, in this vector loop and two unknowns. So it's solvable. You'd write out a component form. You'd plug in the knowns and simplify it, and you'd solve for the two unknowns. And by solving the two unknowns, you'll find the one you actually care about, which is magnitude of R4 as a function of R2. Okay, great. Okay, so here is another, um, uh, there's another example here. Okay, again, put me on pause. Uh, but, but I guess first, first before you put me on pause, um, I just want to point out, notice this cross thing. Can you, uh, usually if you see a cross, it's the center of a circle. You might ask yourself, well, what circle is it the center of? And you might say, okay, well, let's see. We're, we're, the only circles you see here is this one and this one. Is it the center of this circle? No. Center of this circle? No. That's a slot. It's always the center of the central circle. Okay? So it's like, you know, halfway between this one and that one. Circle there, because that's where the pin on that uh, slot slides. So this circle, if I just kept drawing it, you know, would be the cent this guy would be the center of that, okay? And this is ground, this, this is not a sliding joint because notice this is curved here. These edges are curved. And so as a result, even though they've drawn this, this is not a sliding joint. That is fixed, that is pinned. Uh, same thing here. This is not a sliding joint because it's curved, very tricky. Um, but it's pinned to the bottom there. So these two things are ground and they're both labeled one. Okay, this is two, the motors on here, the input. This is three, this little square thing that slides in there, and that's four, this whole link with a slot cut in. Okay, so now you fully understand the mechanism. Now, uh, put it on pause and, and do your vector loop, and then, and then I'll show you the answer when you come back. Okay, I'm gonna assume you did that, that you put it on pause. Um, okay, I'm gonna show you the answer. Um, Okay, and first of all, it's good practice also for these to try doing Kutzbach and a asking yourself, is this a mechanism? Is this a linkage? Are these higher or lower, or, you know, pairs? Um, and, and uh, you know, checking the mobility. Uh, usually, you know, you, you want, um, you know, like, b oh, by the way, this is a really important point. Um, if your mobility is one, then you're going to have one input, right? So you'll have one eye, and it's usually 
theta 2 or r2, right? Because 2 is usually the input. But if your mobility is 2 or more, then you're going to need that two or more motors, that many motors to drive it, right? Because, you know, mobility, the number of degrees of freedom a mechanism has, the number of independent parameters you need to be able to control the full thing. And that means that's the number of inputs.